Good afternoon. Today we are uh, doing a conversation with the legendary Jim Blinn. And we have several things we want to accomplish in this uh, thing. We want to walk through your career. Uh, I want to hit on some of the high points, which I assume are the uh, uh, JPL uh, work, the Utah work, uh, issues of um, image mapping and texture mapping. And then of course, your mechanical universe, your uh, mathematical videos, and then other things I don't know about. <laughs> uh, and Kasich uh, was uh, quite, we, at the very end of that interview, uh, he said two things, one of which of course I've forgotten, but uh, they were insights to the next generation. And one of them, Jim, was the fact that he talked about scalability and how difficult it was. And uh, that might not be your pick, but ideas about things that we can share with youngsters uh, in terms of insights and how they might grow and develop. So, okay, yeah. All right, so tell me your name, please. Uh, James Frederick Lynn. And when were you born? 1949. And where? In Detroit. And where'd you grow up? I grew up in a um, small town, two small towns in the middle of Michigan, one called Belding until I was uh, about nine, and then uh, one called Greenville, where I went to high school and graduated from there. Were you interested in science in high school? Oh yeah, sure. And uh, what led you to college? Well, um, I was always in the college track. Uh, my parents both went to college and so forth, but uh, uh, I guess I was kind of always assumed that's what I was gonna do. And that's what you did? Yeah, yeah. And where'd you go? I went to the University of Michigan. Um, one of my teachers was actually saying, um, gee, Jim, you should go to MIT. But uh, when I mentioned that to my parents, uh, they said, well, unfortunately, we can't afford MIT, but University of Michigan is an in-state school, and so tuition was cheaper, so that's where I went. And I'm kind of glad, because I think I did a, a better at uh, Michigan than I would have at MIT. What did you major in? I started out majoring in uh, physics. Uh, I would had a lot of interest in physics from an early age. Um, but then um, in the middle of my freshman year, I uh, took a computer programming course and got kind of sucked into that and uh, eventually got a job doing computer graphics, uh, helping a project there doing com computer graphics uh, and started doing uh, physics simulations on the uh, computer that they had, uh, or the graphics computer. What kind of graphics did they have at Michigan? Um, the particular uh, thing that we had was uh, a, a PDP-9 computer made by DEC with a uh, DEC 339 display, which is a black and white color, uh, black and white line drawing display. And it was uh, you know, very slow and very small by today's standards, but it was enough to do a lot of interesting experiments with. What kinds of, uh, did you write programs for graphics at that time? Yeah, I uh, started out, um, <clears throat> I had the, the, the good luck to kind of place out of uh, the foreign language requirements. So I took a couple of programming courses before that and I got a job with the uh, graphics, graphics group uh, uh, the summer between my sophomore and junior year. And my main job uh, there was to translate some of their uh, uh, code into uh, 360 assembler language. They had a uh, analysis program that they were analyzing what are called queuing diagrams. And the uh, queuing diagrams were drawn on a computer with a graphics display, the, the, the PDP-9. And at the end of the summer, I was able to kind of move over and start working with the, the uh, graduate student who was doing that and uh, work with him on the, uh, on the, on the computer graphics uh, display. And at, at that point, uh, most of the graduate students graduated and left. And so I was kind of left with a PDP-9 kind of as my own personal computer to play with for the rest of my college career. And what sort of images did you make? Um, Some simulation uh, you were interested well, in. Well, the, uh, the main things were drawing uh, network diagrams. Um, and I modified it to draw electronic circuit diagrams and plug that into a, uh, a uh, analysis program on the main uh, time sharing computer. 
And I also did a logic diagram simulator for drawing uh, the NAND gates and so forth. Then I did a couple of animation experiments with you know stick figure drawing, dancing around. I did some quantum mechanics uh, functions that uh, uh, showed um, <clears throat> particle in a box sort of uh, animations. And uh, I did started doing some 3D line drawing. Uh, and I, um, one of the other professors at the university was, um, um, yeah, the middle blank. Um, 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 Bert Herzog. Like me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and uh, he uh, had a summer uh, course that he gave uh, with um, Steve Coons uh, draw, uh, describing how uh, Coons patches worked. And when I took that, I uh, went back and implemented Coons patches. So I had 3D Coons patches rotating around on the screen uh, on the PDB9, which was a bit of a trick since it was you know a slow computer. You did the perspective calculations and all of that from scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what so were your first... when I when I finished up there I, and went to Utah, I was kind of I had plenty of experience at doing three D graphics even by then. You went to Utah as a doctoral student. Yeah, I uh, hung around in Michigan for another uh, two years and got a master's degree, and then another two years after that, I worked for the computing center, and then I went to Utah. And uh, just, uh, just as they were getting the first color frame buffer going. And so I was able to dive in with that. What year would that have been? 1974. 74. So when was your first SIGGRAPH? Well, 74 was the first SIGGRAPH that was given. Um, I was a member of SIGGRAPH as a student member uh, way before then. It was SIGGRAPH started in like 1969. I was already doing graphics at the time, but I don't remember exactly when I discovered SIGGRAPH, but there were several uh, graphics conferences that they that they sponsored even before the regular yearly one in 1974 uh, that I went to uh, just as a, as a uh, you know in the audience I wasn't presenting or anything. The first SIGGRAPH conference in '74 was the summer uh, that I moved to Utah, and so uh, I I went there and and uh, about the same time I was going to Utah. How did you discover Utah? Um, one of my office mates at Michigan had a, uh, a uh, PhD thesis that he had, somebody had uh, sent to him by uh, Gordon Romney, who was a PhD from the University of Utah. And he said, oh, Jim, you're doing graphics. Maybe you'd be interested in this. And so he showed it to me and I kept borrowing it from him so often that uh, he finally gave it back to me. And I still kind of have it up on my desk uh, up here. <laughs> Uh, it was uh, the, some of the first shaded color graphics that I had seen. And so I studied that uh, intensely and, and got interested in the idea of not just doing black and white line drawing, doing color shaded images as well. So you went to the, you went to Mecca, so to speak, of computer Pretty graphics. Pretty much, yeah, right. I had already gotten on the mailing list. You could see the orange books up there are the, uh, are the uh, I was on the mailing list for their uh, technical reports that they'd sent out about the various projects. So you met all the, you met many of the pioneers there. Will you tell us a little bit about them, please? Uh, a lot of them had graduated and left by the time I was there. Um, Ed Catmull, uh, <clears throat> I met him briefly, uh, but he was just leaving to uh, go uh, back east. And um, the only one who was actually really left was uh, Martin Newell, who became my thesis advisor. So I worked with him uh, we basically uh, uh, co-taught the computer graphics class there for a couple of years while I was a graduate student. Did you know Ivan Sutherland? He had also left at the time, <clears throat> um, went off to the East Coast. Um, I actually met him kind of over the phone through Martin because Ivan was looking for somebody to make a, uh, an image for him that he wanted to use in a talk that he was giving uh, about, uh, the potential, if you're flying an airplane, what are the potential possible places you could be at some time in the future? So it's like an, an overlapping, uh, a cone kind of extending out. And so he kind of described to me, uh, he introduced, Martin introduced me to, I went over the phone and I, um, he described to me the picture that he wanted. So I went and was able to make that and send it off to him. So that was my introduction to Martin. Uh, to, what uh, Steve to, uh, Coons? Huh? Was he was at Utah briefly. Yeah, he uh, actually came out and I'd already met him 
you know, at Michigan, but uh, he came out and he uh, did some lectures uh, the same year that I got to uh, Utah as well. And it was, it was, he was sort of teaching the class, uh, the graphics class there to start out with for undergraduates, but all the uh, graduate students that were interested in that all kind of piled in and kind of audited the class sitting in the back of, back of the room. So I did that. So your work at Utah, you, you sort of straightened me out on this, but you kind of came into there at a time when people already know, knew how to do Lambert shading and Garo and Fong had worked up some of the uh, issues of normals and interpolation and you yeah. arrive in yeah, this yeah. Uh, complex. Can you frame this well, for us a little bit? Um, the first thing I did on the uh, on the uh, graphics computer, the, the the color display, the frame buffer they had there, I wrote a simple paint program uh, to play around with it. But then I did a kind of re-implementation of Ed Catmull's uh, patch drawing program, and implemented the uh, lighting models that um, Fong had done, which had Lambert shading and and some uh, specular component to it. Played around with that, <clears throat> and it occurred to me that maybe there was a, a uh, better lighting models available through the the uh, uh, research in the physics community. So I actually spent a couple of weeks prowling around in the uh, basement of the uh, engineering library, looking at the bound volumes of various physics literature they had, just kind of reading off what they were and say, uh, <coughs> trying to see what the physics uh, community had, had done in, in lighting simulation or reflection simulation. And it turned out that um, first thing I found was something called uh, the Journal of the Illumination Engineering Society from uh, a uh, issue in 1921, uh, had a, an article of somebody actually measured the, uh, the light reflection from various directions and they had some graphs plotted in there. And so I was gonna, uh, uh, just digitize that and use that as kind of like a table lookup for the lighting. But then I found something a little bit better uh, from um, uh, University of Minnesota by uh, <clears throat> a guy named Torrance and Sparrow, which was a, uh, a uh, mathematical model of uh, the surface irregularities of, this, of the, uh, of the uh, object. And uh, it's kind of a statistical uh, thing about how much light is reflected in different ways. And so uh, that was the first model after a couple of weeks of poking around that kind of made sense to me. Um, <clears throat> it was originally described in terms of uh, uh, spherical geometry, lots of trigonometric functions and so forth. And there were like two variables that uh, picked out and in, in, in three different functions depending on what the geometry was. So I spent a couple of weeks uh, playing around with that uh, trying to simplify the math to something that was more easily implemented on a computer. And uh, so I published that <clears throat> in one of the SIGGRAPH things a little bit later on. It's called the Terence Sparrow Lighting Model. And it was kind of always interesting to me that uh, uh, later on in life, I discovered that people were implementing that in their, in their per commercial products, which they call the blend lighting model which I always thought was because Torrance Fair was too big to fit onto a menu item. <laughs> now, were you the first person to really combine the mapping of pixel arrays onto three-dimensional geometries or how did well, that Ed come Campbell about? Did, <clears throat> Ed Cappell did that in his thesis. And so that was uh, kind of his, uh, I got the idea from him uh, and he modeled the, uh, the uh, Lambert's reflection as a function of uh, position of the thing and, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if he did specular highlights as well they might have. <clears throat> but then I kind of expanded that to uh, the surface shininess as a function of uh, time and, and, and figured out uh, <clears throat> how to, how to uh, expand the texture mapping to other primer parameters for the lighting. And then uh, at one point I was uh, trying to make an <clears throat> image of um, a molecule of water just to, as a science uh, experiment. And I wanted to make it look kind of like a fuzzy ball of yarn kind of metaphorically to show the things, uh, electrons flying around. But uh, none of them looked very, very good. It looked still too smooth. And so I was kind of looking at some surfaces 
uh, like the surface of my uh, light reflecting off my shoes and realize that part of the reason for that is not so much that the, the color changes from place to place, but that these, there's a slight perturbations in the, in the uh, orientation of the surface from one spot to the next. So working out the math of that, I was able to come up with uh, the bump mapping idea where you can uh, give it a kind of like a, a, an altitude function and it would figure out how the light uh, orientation of the, uh, the reflection vector would uh, model uh, move across the surface. And so that was bump mapping. And you combine that with uh, image or texture mapping. Yeah, right. And then you, you left Utah at some point. Uh, when I graduated from Utah, I um, called up Ivan Sutherland and, 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 uh, and said, uh, I understand you're starting a, a computer graphics project at Caltech, and is there a place for me in your in your uh, department? And he said, Yeah, sure, come on down. And I <clears throat> told him, to be honest with you, I'm actually more interested in JPL, and uh, and uh, I'm probably going. JPL was part of a lab run by Caltech, and I'll probably go and hang out out there and, and see if there's an interesting project I can attach myself to. <clears throat> and I even said, Well. Interestingly enough, there's a guy at JPL who's just bought a copy of all of the hardware that you have at Utah, and he's looking for somebody to run it. And so he hooked me up with Bob Holzman at JPL, and that's how I <clears throat> came there. I started out as JPL at uh, Caltech as a postdoc, and I uh, was a TA for Ivan and his graphics class the first first year there. I was there, and he uh, finally just kind of handed it over to me. He had he was interested in, in integrated circuit design more at the time, so I started teaching graphics at Caltech and simultaneously working at JPL uh, and got hooked up with the, uh, the uh, project uh, mission design manager at, at JPL, Charlie Colhase, who did the Voyager project, got all the data from him on, on how the spacecraft was moving and the uh, geometry and so forth. And so I was able to start simulations of, of the Voyager project when I got there. So I say this with a teasing attitude, but you're the father of fake news. <laughs> well, I'm more of a documentarian rather than a news person. A documentarian? Well, I was, I, I've, <clears throat> I was making uh, simulations of what we expected to see uh, when we got there. And so it was uh, planned as being a, a, a illustration of what was gonna happen with the spacecraft when it got there that they could use on the news broadcasts. Now, it comes to my mind that although what we've talked about so far is physics and mathematics and science, you have a lot of artists in you as well. Uh, my parents were both art teachers. Uh, and so I uh, lived in an artistic household. I was never um, <clears throat> much at drawing myself, but I did uh, do some experiments in, in uh, doing animation with paper cutouts when I was in high school. And uh, when I got to uh, you know, Michigan and, and found the computer could make images like that too, that was a much easier way of doing animation. So I got into that similar for, um, I never uh, um, got into the drawing aspect of it you know, by hand, but uh, just you know, mathematical simulations. Uh, but when uh, the next project after Voyager came along was the uh, mechanical universe, uh, doing uh, illustrations for the um, online physics class. I got more into the graphic design aspects of things. So I spent a lot of time uh, picking colors and arranging compositions on the screen, uh, doing some drawing for some of the uh, simple cartoon characters, uh, but mostly uh, making sure the, the images were as understandable as possible given that we were doing this thing for you know broadcast uh, you know, standard definition television. And you made a whole series of these mechanical universe animations. Yeah, the mechanical universe was a uh, telecourse uh, run by a professor at, Cal at Caltech named David Goodstein. And he <clears throat> kind of modified his freshman uh, level physics course that he had taught the Caltech students uh, for the uh, you know, wider audience. And I uh, was uh, connected to that to do the uh, uh, animated uh, illustrations of the various physics pr principles all the way through. There were a total of 52 half hour programs and I wound up doing uh, probably eight or nine hours worth of animation, some 500 different scenes throughout the entire series. 
my recollection is a lot of them were geometry issues as well, or did that come later? Well, um, squaring the you know some of the square of the sides of a right triangle. Well, after 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 mechanical theory was finished, uh, Tom Apostle, who was the math consultant, the professor of, of math at uh, Caltech, started up a project for doing um, high school level mathematics, and so I got hooked up with that, and so that's where the uh, geometry came from. It was sort of like uh, mathematical prerequisites for the uh, college level mechanical universe. Somewhere in your work, you've uh, talked about the relationship between algebraic formulas and uh, geometric expressions. And I'm not much of a mathematician, but I am a pretty good geometer. And I've always found I could make things work using geometry, but I couldn't make them work using algebra, so to speak. But you are uh, adept at both of those, are you not? Well, I attempt to be. Um... I, I kind of lie in the in the middle ground between uh, engineering and mathemat mathematics. Uh, kind of my hobby is, is algebraic geometry, which is ways of uh, describing the sorts of shapes that a, a particular algebraic equation can can generate. And uh, I've been playing around with ways of understanding that process better. Um, the uh, the, the uh, uh, engineering side of things thinks that kind of what I'm doing is pretty abstract and, and maybe not practically useful a whole lot. And the mathematical side of uh, uh, mathematics petitions feel like uh, what I'm doing is kind of old hat stuff that they you know, studied 100 years ago. And so um, what I'm doing is trying to figure out ways of making the 100 uh, year old mathematics more easily understandable. I think that's a great, uh, I remember in college, uh, one day I had uh, gone off on a mission to see that they had a copy of uh, Euclid's geometry and I was thumbing through it and I was amazed to see this diagram of a right triangle and it showed that if you square the two sides it equaled the square of the hypotenuse. And it was a tremendous insight to me because it showed that this formula which you know, I've been given in high school, but all of a sudden it had a, a meaning and a purpose to it. And I think a lot of your work with the, uh, this kind of visualization is, has been, I wouldn't take uh, these, these poo-pooers, I wouldn't pay much attention <laughs> to them. I think that what you've done in this regard is quite insightful. And I think we probably, if anything, need more of it. Well, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad to, to see that happen. Like I say, I've been working on this off and on for quite a while. And most of it is, was published in the IEEE articles that I wrote uh, columns for IEEE computer graphics and applications. Um, and uh, a couple of them have been included in the books. I've got a whole bunch of kind of half done things that I'm hoping to finish up someday and, and just kind of post on my website. Um, and uh, you know, interesting ways of, of seeing how the algebra and the geometry connect. But what's kind of funny about this is that <clears throat> the mathematicians are now started out doing all geometry back in the ancient Greek days. And then Cart uh, uh, Descartes came along and, and came up with the algebraic connection. And so player, people played around with that a lot. And uh, nowadays, uh, a lot of mathematicians are pulling away from the geometry again, going back to the symbolical aspect of it. There are some aspects of the geometry that the uh, algebraic version of it make a little bit harder to find. And uh, so that's what I'm working on Kind of repairing those deficiencies a bit. The straight line drawing machine was a great challenge at the uh, just before 1900. How whether that could be? Oh yeah, right, right, yeah. You've tackled that one, I'm sure. Um, I've read about it. I haven't played around with that particular uh, uh, thing a whole lot, but I, 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 I'm familiar with it. it. Might be something to look into. Yeah. Give you a give you something to do tomorrow, <laughs> and then you've written these books to uh, right. You've gathered a lot of <clears throat> well. I, I uh, was invited to write a column for the IEEE Computer Graphics and Applications uh, Journal, uh, which is kind of a brain dump of a lot of the ideas that I'd had and the little tutorials on on the uh, mathematics behind computer graphics and various other ideas. And I did that for some twenty years or so. Um, and I must uh, give compliments to the uh, uh, the editorial staff of the magazine with their patience and you know, my getting the articles in on time, which was uh, often a struggle for me. 
but <clears throat> ultimately they were collected together into three different books of uh, reprints of those articles. And uh, there are a few, a few of the best ones I thought at the very tail end that uh, they didn't fit into a book. So you still have to look at the, uh, at the actual journal for those. Okay. What are your, uh, of the articles, what are some of your favorites? Well, um, probably the, the favorite one is the uh, one I, series I did on uh, how to solve a cubic equation, which was something that people have uh, known how to do for some time. There's some interesting books on the history of it. And, but what I did was I tried to research as many different solution processes as I could find and uh, tie them in with the graphical notation that I've been using in, in uh, describing cubic polynomials and uh, found a couple of maybe somewhat obscure techniques to uh, solve the uh, numerical problems and uh, merged them all into kind of one big series of articles about how cubic equations work and what the best numerical way of, of solving it is. And uh, I was pretty happy with that. There was one of the main articles I was able to extract was um, from a French mathematician that came up with some good numerical ideas, but he had a typo in his publication, which I was kind of able to reverse engineer, fix the typo and, and, and uh, use the, the corrected version of that in, 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 in the article. The um, origins of SIGGRAPH, uh, or in my mind, were very much a fusion between uh, science people, computer, computer people, but also artists had a, a role in the organization. And I wonder if you can uh, share your impressions of that aspect of SIGGRAPH and how you see yourself fitting into it, whether it benefited you or whether it was a hindrance? <laughs> well, I think uh, the artistic uh, implements are, are just as important as the technical uh, uh, inputs. Um, as I said, I, I consider myself an artist only from kind of more the graphic design end of things rather than the hand drawing. Uh, uh, but uh, the kind of fusion of, of art and, and, and engineering and SIGGRAPH is I think one of the more interesting aspects of the organization. And it gets kind of like two, two groups of people together in, in, in one room at the same time. And I've done experience with that myself. I worked with a couple of artists at Michigan who were doing projects for, uh, for some uh, installation they did. I did some 3D graphics for them. And I worked uh, with an artist named David M at you know, JPL uh, where he used some of the software to make some of his images. Um, and then uh, it kind of branched out at, at, at uh, SIGGRAPH where a lot of artists uh, kind of joined the club there because it gave them a new tool for making, uh, making visual uh, images. But it's kind of like the fun part of, of seeing them collect together. I uh, did a few uh, experiments. I taught a course at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, which is all design students in the early days of, of, of graphics being available to them. We had some very simple uh, graphics tools there, but I also taught a class at Caltech and I did an experiment where I taught a, a course where we had both students at Art Center and uh, Caltech working together on projects, which was kind of ambitious for the time because uh, the uh, technology wasn't developed quite as well as it might have, but it was, it was, it was an interesting experiment. I, um... Uh, also, like you, cannot draw, but I found the computer to be a way I could uh, uh, compose, so to speak, in this very abstract space. And then it's almost like your work product is cast out of the computer and you look at it and accept it, or you most likely go back and fix it. <laughs> and uh, that abstract way of working I think is lost on a lot of youngsters now. They seem to want to use tools. They don't want to really know how the tools work. And they kind of take this all for granted, so to speak. Um, everybody has a particular set of tools that they, they find that they use. And there's kind of whole levels of tools and you know layers of them. There's, you know, as far as computers goes, there's the hardware, the electrical electronics and building them that from scratch and then layering on top of that is the software. Layering on top of that would be the artistic tools. And uh, it's always good to know a little bit more about the level below what you're 
what you're working with, but uh, going all the way down to the electronics and the physics of, a, of how it works is maybe not necessary for an artist to be able to do something useful. Um, I know that's what I had to say about that. Do you, when, were you, when did you stop making planets? Um, well, I, when the mechanical universe came along, I, I was uh, kind of working full time on that. The uh, Voyager project uh, had an encounter with uh, Uranus in 1986, I think it was. And that was in the middle of the mechanical universe project. So I was able to pause the mechanical universe and work on the 1986 preview movie of uh, Voyager going by Uranus. And uh, also before then there was some, some animations I did of uh, the Galileo mission proposed at the time to Jupiter. Uh, by the time the Voyager got to Neptune in 89, I guess it was, I was full time on the mechanical universe. And so some other people used the software to do that. So the last uh, planet when I did was uh, for Voyager was 1986 for, for Uranus. Although we had planets show up a lot in the mechanical universe. Uh, there was a couple of uh, episodes about how celestial dynamics works. And so I had planets working in that too. Did you ever get interested in, uh, you mentioned simulation, but in things like air flows and fluid dynamics and those kinds of problems? Um, I never got into that too much. Um, the uh, computers that I worked with uh, would have been hard pressed to do much uh, at the time. It, it took kind of more powerful computers than I had to, to do much interesting with fluid flow, I think. When you were at Utah, were you intimidated by the, the, the brutality of what you had to compute in order to make the images you wanted to make? Mm, I don't think so. Um, it was kind of uh, the, next, the next thing I did, you know, each time I tried to do something and I never thought of brutality of computers so much as you do have to kind of massage the computer a lot and optimize the code in order to get the the image to come out in a, in a reasonable amount of time. The uh, images I made at Utah probably took half an hour or so to render. Uh, and I know uh, Sutherland and his company were interested in, in real time graphics and you know simpler images that you could do in real time. But uh, the one nice thing about the frame buffer was that you could actually sit and watch the program work. And it, the, uh, the Catmull algorithm was a kind of recursive subdivision thing where it was uh, coloring the uh, image in and spreading out over the, over the screen. And so it was just kind of entertaining watching the thing slowly color in the image. It didn't go kind of top to bottom. It went kind of keyed with the, the, the shape of the image on the screen. Did you ever have a desire to go into the commercial world like Ed did or Alvi? Um, not really. Um, my parents were both teachers and I was always interested in the education side of things. And so uh, my career has always been in educational institutions at Michigan and at Utah and at Caltech. Um, I taught classes at all three of those places. And the, uh, the main things that I was interested in doing was generating educational materials for other people. And SIGGRAPH, of course. And SIGGRAPH, yeah. Tell us about that experience, please. Um, SIGGRAPH, as I said, I started out going to SIGGRAPH sponsored conferences even before the 1970. For one, but uh, when they started coming on regularly, I went to uh, um, I went to pretty much all of them. But um, the, the nice thing about SIGGRAPH is it gave me a, a, a an audience for uh, for me to show off my my work, uh, publishing papers about how it was done, and uh, showing uh, videos or films of the uh, animations that I did and. Also meeting other friends and colleagues that uh, were doing similar things throughout the country. Do you have uh, uh, people that you consider to be uh, major influences or role models? Um, or, or, I'm not sure what role model means exactly. Well, let, let me rephrase that. Do you have people who, who gave you the kind of encouragement that uh, you were doing, the, uh, the, that what you were doing had merit to it? Not specifically. I, I, I <clears throat> had no doubt that what I was doing had merit. It had merit to me anyway, and that's all it really took. Um, my main influences were uh, books and movies made by various other people that uh, 
<clears throat> that I, I wanted to do something similar to them. Uh, some uh, computer graphics being new was uh, uh, most people didn't, you know, maybe understand it all the time, but uh, when they saw it, they, they th thought that it was pretty cool. So uh, I, I, uh, uh, what were some <laughs> of the things that you saw that, that, hmm? that what were some of the things that you saw that, uh, uh growing up, uh, there were uh, various uh, television programs, uh, two series that affected me a lot. Uh, were uh, the Man in Space series done by uh, the Disney Studio, directed by Ward Kimball, and the um, Bell Science uh, programs that were funded by Bell Telephone that were uh, uh, done by, uh, introduced by an uh, actor named Frank Baxter, or teacher named Frank Baxter. And those impressed me uh, partly because I learned interesting things from them, but also the fact that they used animation as a uh, teaching tool. And so that gave me the idea that animation uh, could be used as a teaching tool. And that's kind of what motivated me throughout my career. Did you come in contact with Ken Knowlton? I uh, met him at uh, one or two of the SIGGRAPH uh, meetings at one time or another. I can't say we were good buddies, but we, uh, we chatted and, and I kind of was uh, appreciative of what his work was. It was somewhat a different style than what I was doing. Uh, and uh, what about Turner Witted and uh, ray tracing? Turner, uh, I met Turner at SIGGRAPH, which is one of the uh, advantages of SIGGRAPH. You get to meet uh, uh, other colleagues and, uh, and uh, get to know him. And he, uh, I met him, I guess it was the second conference that, uh, he was working on a, a rendering technique for like cubic patches as well. And, and I think it was Ed Catmull introduced us together and he and I were both working on the same problem and we were in the, in the back of the room. We got really excited uh, talking to each other about, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? And so, you know, we were getting so loud that the, uh, that the people were saying, why don't you take this out in the hallway? Cause you're <laughs> distracting us from the speaker. What about the Magi people? They did early, uh... Yeah, they were uh, in a totally different uh, group. Um, the only Magi person that I, I interacted with much was um, Ken Perlin. I just met him and he became a friend, uh, but uh, uh, we didn't like work together or anything like that. It was just a, a parallel development that they were doing at that time. In terms of um... You're a self-motivator and a learner and a book researcher and that kind of stuff. So uh, people of our age sometimes think that youngsters don't know how to use books and don't know how to do homework. By that, I mean research. I don't mean, you know, like laboratory research, but I mean go to the library type of research. Uh, what's your perception of where we are now in the educational systems and uh, what do we need to do to you know, make America great again. To Ooh, <laughs> there's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, the the uh, availability of information to to students is so much better nowadays than it was back when I was in, in graduate school that uh, you can't help but have a good good influence. Um, Google and uh, YouTube are. Uh, going to bring uh, information to so many people who wouldn't have access to it uh, before that uh, I think that's all a great thing. Uh, when I did my uh, research in how to uh, reflect light off of surfaces, um, you know, I had access to a library uh, that I spent a lot of time poking around in. But uh, nowadays you can, anybody, you know, can do that from, the, from their terminal, no matter where they are, no matter if they're in school or not. Uh, they can they can see a lot of this stuff. Uh, hopefully, not too many much of it is behind a paywall, but still, there's a lot of it available. Similarly, YouTube has an astonishing amount of uh, educational videos on that people are making in mathematics, and physics, and whatnot. And I've been uh, including you been learning stuff a lot by looking at a lot of these things. I'm learning a lot of math uh, from from that that I uh, I didn't quite understand before. Uh, I found that it's difficult for me to learn math from mathematics books primarily because the mathematicians are more interested in 
being very formal and uh, showing general results. Uh, and uh, a lot of the YouTube videos that I've seen are, are better for my uh, learning technique of uh, understanding you know, why you need this and, and, and why, it's, why it's designed the way it is and so forth. So that's uh, a resource that I'm having a good time with and I hope a lot of other people will too. And you're a contributor in those worlds as well. Well, the mechanical universe and um, mechanical universe and, and the project mathematics and mathematics series are all up on YouTube on Caltech's channel. So anybody who wants to can watch those, uh, as well as you know the uh, snowstorm of other mathematics educational videos and, and physics educational videos as well. What's uh, when, uh, we talked to Kasich, He had a couple. Um, one of the things we asked him was uh, in terms of the future. What are some of the I hate to use the word lessons learned, but what are some of the things that uh, uh, some of the, what I'm looking for are techniques to uh, make breakthroughs in. How do we, how do we make this, how do we make this, you, you're a man who's made discoveries. You're a man who's been done pioneering work. And how, how does one go about doing that? And if one's a young person and interested in computer graphics, I mean, the world is changing rapidly, but what are some, what are some insights that we can tell younger people to look for or avoid? Um, well, uh, I felt like what I did was put together ideas from a lot of different sources. And so I'm kind of more of a person who glues ideas together from other people and you know, hopefully give them the appropriate credit. Um, uh, so I'm not sure what I could say to the younger generation because things are so different now than, than uh, they were when I was, was doing things. Basically, I feel like I was incredibly lucky to get into business when uh, all the easy problems hadn't been solved. And now uh, those are solved pretty much. And now the harder problems are coming along. And so, and plus there's, you know, so many more people doing it. So it's harder for a particular person to make a name for themselves and to stand out because uh, uh, there's so many people working on it. But uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, I do say that uh, a couple of things that I wish I had done differently was to basically um, document what I did better. Uh, nowadays, that's easy, you know, the cameras and, and, and making a video of things is simple, but uh, I wish I'd taken more pictures of what I did and and labeled them with dates and so forth so I can remember what I did when. And uh, another uh, thing that I found just as a tool for, for doing something was uh, what I would call stability of platform, which is um, when I was at Utah, we used a, a, PDP, a PDP 11 and, and everything was in Fortran. And when I went to, to JPL, I was able to build up a lot of code and so forth and tools and take them with me to, to JPL because they had the same hardware. And, uh, and then when I uh, moved ultimately to PCs, it also you know, had very similar hardware. So I didn't have to re-implement everything from scratch each time. And a lot of people have to, uh, when they change from one system to another, spend a lot of time learning the new system. So that was one thing that helped me, uh, continuity of the, the systems that I used. What about advice to not youngsters, but people who are um, a little bit younger than you and who actually have managerial responsibilities in universities and laboratories and research firms? How, what can... What... Um, I was able to avoid uh, getting into management pretty well because I would make a terrible manager. I'm, uh, I don't like telling people what to do. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if I have any really good advice other than uh, you know, encouraging more people to get into it from different uh, backgrounds, uh, different genders, whatnot, you know, increase the diversity. Hopefully we can get uh, more viewpoints from, from lots of different things like that and uh, bring that all into the, into the, into the, into the group. What do you think uh, needs to be discussed? You said all the easy problems are solved. What are the hard problems that are ahead of us? Um, finding something that hasn't been done yet. <laughs> um, basically, it's now a, a kind of a mature tool. I guess you could make uh, analogies to uh, 
uh, music. Musical instruments were invented over the years, and uh, after a while, they kind of matured. And you know, piano has been pianos and uh, and uh, clarinets and so forth haven't changed a whole lot in several hundred years. And so, as people use them for new kinds of musical expression, it'll be uh, they invented you know jazz and so forth, which is wildly different than the inventors of the inf instruments came up with. And I expect something similar would happen with computer graphics. People will find more and more interesting things to do with it that the inventors of it never even thought of. There was a time at SIGGRAPH when it spanned the range from computer art to mathematical uh, explorations to uh, CAD CAM to uh, um, flow modeling uh, and later games. It seems now that much of that has dispersed. Can you talk a little bit about what you see has been the evolution of the organization, both in a positive and a, a, a whimsical way? Um, to be honest, I haven't really kept track of, of um, much of the recent de developments myself. Um, I have other things that I'm, I'm, I'm doing. Uh, so it's hard for me to say. It's, it's kind of too bad that a lot of these diverse different subjects may be done less, but I suspect what's happening is um, they're being done as much as they have done bef before, but there's so many other people doing um, movie special effects and so forth that uh, those get people's attention more. And what about games, video games especially? Video games uh, also, I, I understand the game industry uh, financially at least is exceeds the sum of all the music and, and, and film industry combined. Um, and the, the things that they do in video games are astonishing to me in terms of the, the visual quality. The actual content sometimes I think is a little bit disturbing. Uh, the ideas of people, you know, simulating going to war for entertainment purposes, I, I, I'm not sure that's a great idea. But uh, there are a lot of computer games that I have enjoyed, uh, more of the, the uh, puzzle solving types of things that, uh, that uh, are, are pretty fun. I was in a, interviewed in Brazil many years ago. This was during the first Gulf War. And they worried that the Americans could not tell the difference between playing video games and operating military equipment at a distance. That's could be. I, I don't know anything you know firsthand by that, but uh, <clears throat> it sounds like an interesting idea. I'm not sure it's necessarily true just because it's an interesting idea, though. You don't know that you, you don't subscribe to it having merit necessarily. Um, I think the world is always a lot different than anybody thinks it is. So uh, any interesting idea, I just think of as an interesting idea rather than something that's automatically true because it's interesting. I see. You want to ask me a question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, what have you been doing these days? I haven't talked to you in a long time. Well, you and I, if you haven't been to a SIGGRAPH recently, I haven't either. And I've been a little, um, in one hand, overwhelmed by the Hollywood capacity. Um, it seems like we're at a point now where we can actually simulate human beings and uh, unless you look at it really carefully, you can't tell the difference. Yeah. And their uh, use of this uh, tool, this imagery, is so skillfully blended between live action and, and models and computer generated imagery that they have a, you know, a, a extremely rich world that they, you know, we're no longer Harry Housen. What's his name? Harry Housen. And, and yeah. We're past that in, in a realm where we can't tell whether the dinosaurs are real or not. And uh, the conference is terribly dominated by uh, that, that faction of the uh, industry. And I think uh, 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 folks like you or Jeffrey Potsdamer, uh, mathematical geometers are uh, lonely there, put it that way. I haven't. <laughs> I, I haven't, not being a person who's necessarily interested in Hollywood movies or in making them anymore, I find the, um, uh, I find myself a little lonely at the, at the conference, just mm -hmm. to be candid with you. 
Well, movies are fun and I enjoy seeing what, what, what they're doing. Um, the simulation of, of live action, of, of real characters or synthetic simulation of synthetic characters that look real is, is pretty astonishing in terms of uh, how, how accurately they're doing it nowadays. What's kind of funny is that um, back umpty ump years ago, they used to have what they call a cast of thousands in a movie where, you know, in the Cecil B. DeMille era, they would have a thousand actors all grouped together, uh, being the background images or the uh, to the action on the scene. And nowadays, if you look at uh, uh, that's all done with computer simulation, but there's a lot of uh, people that need to be employed to to make those. And if you look at the credits roll uh, after any uh, movie like that, there's still a cast of thousands, but there are all thousands of people running their computers making the the pictures of pictures of uh, people that are on the screen. Maybe it'd be simpler to hire people and put them on the screen, <laughs> huh? Uh, you, uh, Utah and at JPL, you primarily, and straighten me out on this, engage in what one might call kinematic modeling. At some um, point, the industry moved to doing what might be called dynamic modeling, where we started to model the forces acting on objects rather than simply the pivoting of joints. Well, okay, yeah, right. Where did you fit into that? Um, how, I don't know how did it, that fit into your world? I don't know if I fit in other than I use the kinematics in the sense of, uh, you know, making joint angles and, and so forth being the the uh, inputs that you have to to give rather than you know forces. The Jupiter um, flybys and the, so on, those missions are done kinematically or do you calculate gravity and all of that? Uh, the flybys specifically were uh, done by uh, calculating the uh, positions of things uh, uh, in their orbits, which was, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of like a, a kind of a closed form solution called solving the Kepler equation. And so the positions of everything is, is, is uh, solved by the Keplerian uh, orbits. Uh, and the orientation was done by uh, getting the mission plan and, and, and figuring out the orientation of the spacecraft with respect to these things as they went by. So it was a very simple actual simulation compared to fluid dynamics or, or any sort of uh, uh, complicated uh, dynamics uh, of multi-jointed objects. So I was able to, to uh, do the, you know, the things that I wanted to do without having to get into a lot of the elaborate physics simulation. What about planning the missions themselves where you're putting this uh, object of several hundred pounds into outer space and you've got a lot of different forces of gravity acting on it? How do you work out a problem like that? Yeah, that wasn't me. That was uh, other people. Um, the guy I worked with, Charlie Colhase, was the head of the mission planning team, and they did a lot of simulations of, of uh, <clears throat> just actually, you know, integrating along the the, the path to figure out uh, where the spacecraft could could go given various uh, uh, timing and aim, aiming and so forth. So I kind of, kind of got just the results of what they did, kind of encapsulated for the uh, the math that I needed to do to to simulate it. Did you ever feel a desire to go in that direction? Um, not so much. It was uh, um, too much responsibility <laughs> of, of being able to making sure that you're getting the right thing uh, simulated so that uh, you know, it worked out the way you expected it to. Now the mechanical universe and your mathematical animations deal a lot with all kinds of forces, correct? Again, it was it was a, um, a freshman college level physics, and so it was fairly simple kinematics uh, in that as well. Um, I did do a lot of simulations of uh, of uh, uh, magnetic field and electric fields, <clears throat> but again, it was fairly static. So again, I, I was able to uh, do the things I wanted to do uh, without having to delve into the uh, the incredibly complicated. Uh, dynamic end of things. What do you want to do now? Mostly I'm trying to figure out how to uh, prove the cayley bacharach theorem using tensor diagrams. Yeah, well, you probably don't <laughs> want to explain that to me, but try. Um, if you uh, imagine a um, second order curve 
which would be a circle or an ellipse and so forth, it takes uh, five points to uniquely specify that. And if you can imagine a, a, a program easy to come up with that would let you move those points around on the screen and it would calculate what the curve is. So you can move it around and five points will, will uniquely def define a second order curve. If you go up to cubic curves, it takes nine points and you can you know, get a program that does that. You move the nine points around and it'll put the cubic curve through there. Um, and if you kind of leave eight of them, uh, eight, eight of them uh, alone and just move one point around, what you'll find is that you know, the curve will stretch around in order to move through all those nine points. But as you move that point around, you'll discover that all the curves that you generate this way actually go through one other magical point. And so that's uh, the Cayley back rack theorem effect effectively. And so proving that, that all the curves that you generate with those nine points also have uh, a, uh, another point that they have in common. Now, the tensor diagram technique that I use is a way of taking the algebra of the, of the cubic functions and being able to uh, uh, solve the equations and, and express the, the geometry that they do in a way that uh, ultimately uh, is easier to uh, evaluate. The uh, geometry for a cubic uh, curve, or the algebra for a cubic curve winds up uh, with a, a, a function which has something like 10,000 terms in it. And so the uh, techniques that I'm playing around with are a way of managing that so that you can you can do things with it uh, and, and, and prove things like that without having to do 10,000 terms. Do you find that the youngsters and the students you encounter, the graduate students, the college students have the kind of intellect and drive to attack, attack these kinds of problems and like you did as a younger man? Um, well, I haven't really interacted with students for quite a while now, so uh, I'm not sure, but um, given the Given the things that I see been posted on YouTube, certainly uh, there's a lot of them who who, who are uh, are doing interesting things with that. We're almost out of time, so uh, any last any final thoughts to your many admirers? Well, um, thank you for admiring me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was lucky, uh, incredibly lucky in my career by being in the right place at the right time and. Uh, being able to uh, have equipment available to me that not everybody did in order to do all those, uh, the cool things that I did. And uh, I was able to do things that were so, so amazing to me uh, if I was to look at it uh, uh, when I was really young that uh, it's just, you know, uh, I'm really happy with what I've been able to accomplish. And it wasn't because you're taller than most people? <laughs> Well, there are a lot of tall computer graphics people, uh, but uh, that- um, Tall that, politicians too, you would probably qualify to- <laughs> Yeah, so I'm told. But uh, computers don't care how tall you are or how short you are. They'll do stuff if you, uh, if you massage them enough. And they've been kind to women too, I think. But, uh, yeah, well, everybody gets a chance to play with it, I hope. And uh, now that computers are more easily available, everybody can, uh, a lot more people can get at them than, than have been in the past. You own one yourself? What's that? You own a computer yourself, right? No, the one I'm using right now to talk to you with. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have, I think something like 20 computers in my house of various uh, ages and so forth. And uh, most of them have something wrong with them, but uh, at least we have enough going to keep us going here. And they all have a program that is critical that has to run on that one and is not convertible. That's basically and... it, yeah, <laughs> right. Well, thank you for talking with me as a uh, agent of the uh, SIGGRAPH people and we've been drafted to ask you all the... <laughs> the... No, thank you.